in a couple minutes, they will have missed stuff that they'll be glad to miss, I think. Anyway, I'm Dallin Durfee. I'm, a, I'm an experimental physicist at BYU, and I'm going to give you a very, very basic introduction to hobbyist electronics. And I should say, I haven't done, there's probably people who've done a lot more hobbyist electronics than I have, but the stuff I do at work is a lot like hobbyist electronics, because I have very little formal training in electronics. A great need, I've found a great need for it in the experiments that I've done, and so I've had to, with my students, figure out a lot of things, uh, kind of the way I guess most of you would do if you were doing electronics at home, uh, with the difference that I have a, a budget to buy probably more expensive stuff than some of you do. All right, and so I've been doing electronics for a long time, I've uh, done some really cool things. And I'm not going to tell you about any of them today because I promised to give a, a basic introduction. So if you've done electronics before, probably you won't get anything out of this. But if you're just brand new and you're, you know, I'm a coder and I've heard these Arduino things are great and I want to do some cool project with them, but I've never ever done any electronics, then this is the class for you um, just to get jump started and get, uh, get your feet wet. Now, um, my target, my goal for this is not to teach you lots of fancy electronics. You're not going to leave this class and go and, and make some amazing robot with your Arduino. But what you will hopefully get is a familiarity with how electronics is done, what the different terminology is, so that you're not afraid to go on the web or go somewhere else and find information and start working on your own. You can learn a lot of electronics just tinkering by yourself. once you get over the barrier and realize it's really not that hard to get started. Um, most electronic components you work with are very inexpensive, and so if you make a mistake and blow something up, it's okay, you know, buy another one and do it again. So it's really something you can learn at home, with a few exceptions. There's some expensive stuff out there. Now, so at the end of this talk, I forgot to put a list of where you can go to get more information, but I have it here at the beginning of the talk for some reason. So if you like what you saw and want to do more electronics, there's lots of places to learn about electronics. I mean, Wikipedia and Google are the standard places. You want to build an amplifier, go to Google and say, how do I build an amplifier? And you'll find pages with schematics and instructions. I learned electronics from a book called The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill. Uh, it, it was the Bible of hobbyist electronics until the internet came along, so it's not used as much, I think, because there's so many good free resources online. But if you want to find a good book that just has all kinds of, it's, it's a little dated, it doesn't, it's not going to have the latest technology, but analog electronics hasn't changed that much you know, in the last decade, so fun book. All right, so I'm going to start off. Uh, just showing you some of the essential tools that you'll need to get started with electronics because I thought that would keep you awake and then we'll get to the you know math stuff later. But this is what's known as a solderless breadboard or a springboard. All right, and you, so you can probably see it better in the picture. It's a way that you can put your electronics together and test them quickly. So it's got these little holes and you can stick a wire or a resistor lead or something into the holes and it's spring loaded, it'll hold it there. And each of these holes in this column here, and this column here, and this column here, they're all connected together. So if I plug a chip in here, if I plug a wire in here, that wire will be conducted, connected to that pin on that chip. They don't connect across this boundary right here. So these ones are connected to these ones, and these ones are connected to these ones. There's also some buses at the top where you can plug your power supply in here, and then all of these pins up here will be powered. They're all connected together. Typically on these boards, there's a break right in the middle. So these ones here are not connected to these ones here unless you put a wire and jumper them together. But they give you four buses that are broken in the middle so you can have you know, plus power, minus power, ground, whatever, however you want to lay it out. All right. Now, they're really quick to work with because you don't have to solder things together. You can try things out. And I know people who will build complicated circuits. I know people who do like physics research and they'll build some a device to lock their laser to an atomic resonance and they'll build it on one of these boards, they'll debug it, they'll get it working and they'll stick some double-sided tape on the back of it, stick it inside of a metal box and close it and they're done. <laughs> I think that is a very bad idea because these things get flaky. They tend to sometimes not make the connections as well as they should. And so when I use them, I usually will make if I have a complicated circuit, I'll build a little part of that circuit, make sure that that part is doing what it's supposed to do, then I'll take it off and solder it to a circuit board, make sure it still works, and then build the next piece and kind of have wires going back and forth. And sometimes if I'm really confident, since I've been doing this for a long time, if it's a, if it's a circuit I've built before many times, I won't even bother with this. I'll just go and solder it down. And sometimes that means you have to unsolder things, which takes more time, but these can be unreliable. But they're quick to work with. So. 
The next step, once you get part of your circuit working and you want to make it more reliable, you'll put it on a vector board. I have some examples of vector board here, or a, call it vector board's one name, that's actually a brand name, perf board, perforated circuit board. Um, so it's basically, it's a circuit board like what's in your computer, except it's not designed with any particular circuit in mind. It's just got a whole bunch of holes in it that you can put components in. Now, when you go to buy circuit board, make sure that you buy perforated circuit board, because they also sell circuit boards that don't have holes in them. And that's not very useful for your purposes, probably. Also, um, this, is, this is one that I designed for my lab. We make do so many electronics, I decided I wanted my own custom generic circuit board where we could do some surface mount stuff and whatnot. But here's, like, here's a picture of a commercial board. And what you'll notice is, not only does it have holes, but most of these holes have metal on them. That's good. You can buy a circuit board which just has holes in it and no metal. It's really hard to solder your circuit to plastic. All right. Also notice that instead of some circuit boards, they'll have one little metal pad for each hole. And that makes it hard to do electronics because if I stick a chip in here and solder it down, and I put the wire right here, if those two aren't connected together, the wire won't be connected to my chip. So what you want to get are uh, perforated circuit boards with multiple hole pads, like three hole pads, all right? And that way I can plug a chip in here, put a wire here, put a resistor, resistor leader, or whatever, and they'll all be connected together once I solder them down. They have kind of the same pattern as the springboard I showed you earlier, all right? Okay, of course you're gonna need wire to put things together, so let me tell you a little bit about wire. Um, wire comes in different thicknesses, you probably noticed that. Uh, they use this term AWG usually to describe the thickness of wire. That stands for American Wire Gauge. The bigger the number, the smaller the wire. All right, it's backwards. Uh, of course, small wire is very flexible, but it's also maybe likely to break. Bigger wire is less flexible and more expensive. I like to work with something around 22 uh, AWG for uh, standard hobbyist electronics, unless you're doing something that carries a lot of current and you need a thicker wire. But for most things, 22 gauge is good. All right. Also, you can get wire that's solid or stranded. So in a stranded wire, if you were to get a 22 gauge stranded wire, if you peel the insulation back, what you'll see is a lot of wires that are a lot smaller than 22 gauge, but then bundled together, they make up a 22 gauge wire. And that makes the wire more flexible. But it also makes it hard to stick into your springboard. That's why you have to solder yeah, so I recommend when you buy wire, for most projects, just buy solid wire unless you've got a reason not to. All right? Okay. Now, once you've got your wire, you need something to cut it with and something to strip the insulation off of it with. All right? Um, wire strippers, they'll have little holes in them that are different sizes, and they'll have a little marking that tells you what gauge of wire to use. It's a good idea to use the hole with the correct gauge, because if you use a hole that's too small, it'll nick your wire and it may work but you may put a little nick on your wire and eventually that's going to turn into a break and your wire will break. If you use one that's too big, you can sometimes get away with using one that's a little too big, but if it's too big, it's just not going to grip the insulation and it's not going to strip very well. Wire strippers usually have a little cutter on it, but usually that's not sufficient. If you put a resistor in and you need to trim the lead off, it's no good having all this junk in front of where you're trying to clip. So I like to have a little uh, side clipper as well. All right. And there's just a picture of a wire and I've stripped some insulation off of it. All right, now another thing you want is you want to have an assortment of resistors. When I first learned about electronics, resistors seemed like the stupidest thing in the world. I get this voltage, why do I want to let some resistors suck it up? But it turns out they're essential in just about everything you do. And so it's good to just, they're, they're inexpensive. So when you go to do a project, you're gonna find the parts that you need to buy for the project, also buy when you're first getting started, you know, maybe a hundred different resistors in different sizes just to have around so that when you need a different size resistor, you don't have to run to the store or order something online. All right, multimeter. This is another essential. A multimeter looks something like this, and you can get them at, boy, you can spend anywhere from, you know, 15 bucks to... I was going to say, you probably can go down and find one for a radio for like five bucks. You probably can. Probably an analog one, right, with a needle. Yeah, so there are some really cheap ones. If you want a digital one that's a little easier to work with, you can get them for 15, 20 bucks. So they're not too expensive. There are, if you're really, really, you know, short on funds, you can get analog ones even cheaper than that. But you can spend arbitrary amounts of money on these. I have one in my lab that's basically this. It's a bigger rack mount unit, and it's $20,000. But you don't need that to do hobbyist electronics. 
All right. Um, a multimeter will typically measure at least current and voltage, and we'll talk about those later on. But the nice ones will also measure things like how big your resistor is. It'll measure resistance, what capacitance your capacitor has. So they have more and more functions you can add on there um, that are fun to have. All right. Now, just a little note on using a multimeter. So we're going to talk more about what current and voltage is in just a minute. But basically, voltage is... I should, have, I should have talked about it sooner, so let's go ahead and talk about it now. Um, voltage, if, to make an analogy with water flowing, in electronics we worry a lot about voltage and we worry about current, all right? Voltage is like pressure. If I have a water pipe and I want water to flow through it, I have to have a higher pressure on one side of the pipe than the other. If the pressure is the same on both sides of the pipe, no water is going to flow, all right? So voltage is like pressure. Voltage, or we also call it potential, all right? Current is the actual flow of charge, all right? This is a schematic right here. This symbol represents a battery, and this symbol represents a resistor. And the lines between them represent wires hooking them up, all right? Now, wires are made out of conductors, and kind of usually the, the thing we have in our back of our, the back of our mind is conductors have the same voltage everywhere. So if I measured the voltage here, it would be the same as the voltage there, all right? Another thing to know about voltage is that only, only voltage or potential difference matters. So you could say this is 20 volts. That doesn't mean anything to me. That doesn't tell me anything about the circuit. In fact, you get one freebie with any circuit. Any circuit, you can come along at any point and say, I define that to be zero volts. And you're free to do that because absolute voltages don't matter, only differences. A battery's job is to make sure that there's a constant voltage difference between here and here. So if this is a nine volt battery, its job is to say, whatever the voltage is here, the voltage there is going to be 9 volts higher. All right. So let's say I wanted to measure the voltage difference across this resistor here. How would I measure that with my meter? Well, it turns out in <coughs> voltage mode, your meter does not let very much current flow. And you can just touch your leads. So you see I've got my multimeter right here. I just take these two leads. I touch one to either side. And it'll tell me the difference in voltage between those two sides. All right, and then I know what the voltage is across the capacitor or across the resistor. If I wanted to know what the voltage was across the battery, I just put my leads on either side of the battery, and it'll tell me what the voltage is. Now, voltmeters tend to be very close to ideally what we want them to be. They don't let very much current flow through them, so it doesn't affect your circuit very much when you touch them. I mean, depending on what, there's always times when you care about it, but for most projects, you can pretend like your voltmeter is perfect. Now. I can also use my multimeter to measure current. But to measure current, you actually have to break your circuit and insert your meter into the circuit so that the current flows through your meter. All right? Also, <coughs> the, the meter tends to be a little bit resistive. So when you put a current meter in, it will affect your circuit a little bit. Now, if you use an analog meter, it'll affect your circuit a lot more than a digital meter, typically, when you're measuring current. Voltage analog meters are pretty good. All right, so this is one reason to have a digital meter. If you want to measure current, it'll affect your circuit a lot less typically. All right, um, but it does affect your circuit more typically than measuring voltage. And another thing is you have to, you know, change your circuit. You have to break the wire in order to make the measurement. So for that reason, usually when we debug our circuits, mostly we're looking at voltages because it's the easier thing to do. OK, this is a tool you probably won't need for hobbyist electronics. <laughs> All right, another thing you're going to need is a soldering iron. And if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit about how to do good soldering. If not, you'll have to read about it online. Um, soldering irons are another tool. You can get one for you know, 10, 15 bucks that will serve your purpose. You can also spend $1,000 on a soldering iron, you know, just a personal soldering iron. So, you know. As you get more and more advanced, you may decide that you could work faster and have more fun if you had a better soldering iron, but you can get started right away. Um, a soldering iron, uh, usually the cheap ones come with a very simple improvised stand, which will work, but you just have to be very careful because you plug them in and they get hot. That's what they do, right? Um, and then you melt this solder, this low melt melting point metal, onto things to hold them together. And so you've got to be careful. It could start your house on fire if you're not careful with it. Also, if you leave your soldering iron plugged in, chances are you won't burn down your house. My students leave them plugged in all the time. And they're safely put in their holder so nothing bad happens, except they come to the lab the next day, and the soldering iron has been on all night, and the tip oxidizes and gets ruined. So another reason not to leave your soldering irons on accidentally 
this will ruin the tip. All right, now, when you solder things down, inevitably, eventually something's gonna break or you will have done something wrong, and so you have to desolder something. You have to get a component off the board. So to do that, you use a device like this. This is known as a desoldering tool or a solder pump. And you see it's spring-loaded. I push this button in here. It cocks the spring. I put my soldering iron on the solder. Once the solder is liquid, I hold this. I put this right up to it. The tip is designed not to melt at that temperature. And I push this button, and it sucks the solder up into it. So that's a desoldering tool. Handy thing to have. All right. Now, those are the basic tools you need as you get going. Start doing more fancy circuits. At some point, you're probably going to want an oscilloscope or a function generator. They're a little more expensive than the things I've discussed here. Um, but you don't need them to get started. An oscilloscope, basically, it's like a multimeter. It shows you what the voltage is, but it shows you a plot of how it changes with time. So if you're looking, you know, making an audio signal come out of your Arduino or whatever, you can look at it and see what the waveform is. And a function generator does the opposite. It doesn't tell you what a waveform is. It makes a waveform for you. So if you wanted to make a sine wave at some frequency to test your circuit, a function generator will do that for you. OK, where do you get all this stuff? My favorite place to get to buy electronics is a place called DigiKey. It's online. They have lots of stuff, um, decent prices. Uh, another place I'll buy things from a lot is Mauser. Now, I use DigiKey a lot, but honestly, for hobbyist stuff, Mauser tends to have, like I say, I do most of my hobby electronics actually at work where I have a budget to buy more expensive things. Mauser tends to have more of the hobbyist grade tools that you would want. So that's another good place. And they also have a really good selection of all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've bought stuff from Allied Electronics before. They have a great selection. Their search engine is horrible, though. So unless you know exactly what part number you're looking for, you probably won't find it there. Don't forget about eBay. You probably don't want to mess with eBay to buy resistors because they're just too cheap, right? But if the day comes you want to buy an oscilloscope, you can get a good deal. You know, Don't forget that you can buy used things and save a lot of money. If you need something really quickly and don't want to, yes? I just wanted to add to that. Railco? Ray Elko. Ray Elko. Thank you. That's a good one. If you live down here in Orem, I don't think they have one down here. I'm not familiar with no, them. They, they just mm -hmm. have Central Utah is all I know. Yeah. I think Ray Elko is like 27th South. Yeah. Something like that. What was the address? 27th South Main Street. 27th South Main Street in Salt Lake. Yeah. Cool. That's good to know about. Radio Shack used to have lots of electronic stuff, but they are kind of so getting out of that business. But if you need a resistor really fast, um, they, bucks for it. Yeah, they'll, they'll have it there. It's, there's a trick with Radio Shack, though, because if you go, you just need a resistor, right? I just, I just need a 10K resistor. You go there, a salesman's going to walk up, and they're going to want to know your life history, and they're going to want to help you, and they won't know. How many of you have never done electronics before? Okay, you probably still know more than that sales guy there, but he's going to want to help you. So it, it pays to get a friend and have your friend go and look at like some expensive cell phone and distract them while you go and find the part you want. But <laughs> if you live here in Utah Valley, Central Utah Electronics, it's down in Provo near the cemetery. That's a really good place. A lot of the stuff there has been sitting on the shelves collecting de dust forever, but resistors you know, are still resistors. They still work. And the guy who works there knows what he's talking about. So that's a good place to go if you need to get something quickly. Now, I went through and I bought, I didn't buy, I made a list of kind of everything you need to get started in addition to the specific chips you would need for your project. All right, so if you have some project in mind you want to get started, I thought this would be nice. You could just, here's some stuff you can buy without being confused. Yes? Well, and your resistors and your capacitors, uh -huh. how many came in the pack? Okay, so the 10K resistors, this is like price per one. Okay. And if you buy like a, a hundred of them, it's going to be less than that, right? So they have, I just kind of gave you the price for one. Okay. All right? Um, this resistor kit, this is just something that DigiKey, they just take some of their standard resistors. They have like a select, an assortment of 360 different resistors, and they put them together, and you can buy them. So for 15 bucks, instead of going through and buying them one at a time, you can just buy that, and you get this nice assortment. Now, um, I should point out here, okay, you're not going to have time to write this whole list down, but with this QR code or this URL, you can go, and my whole talk is online, all right? So you might want to write that down. And this will be here for the whole talk. It won't disappear when I advance the slide. So you can go to my slides and get this whole list. Now, I should point out that, that my list was based on specs, not direct experience. This is not the perforated board that I use. You know, this is not necessarily the wire stripper that I use. 
I use the good stuff, like I said, I have a budget for this. Um, but I went through and looked and said, okay, based on the specifications, if I were gonna, gonna just buy something for myself to get started, you know, maybe put a kit together for my kids to get started, this is what I would buy. And hopefully everything would work out well. So, but no guarantees, all right? But it'll get you the right gauge of wire and things without having to go through and scratch your head and wonder about things because you haven't done this before, you don't maybe necessarily know what all the terms mean when you get online. But you will once you play with them. All right, so now, now I've told you what you need to do electronics. Now we need to actually get to the nitty gritty of how does electronics works work. And I'm just going to give you the very basic of all of this. All right, so you're not going to go away being brilliant with electronics, but you'll understand the terminology and how electronics is done, and you'll be equipped to go and find out more. All right, so I mentioned before that there's, when we do electrical circuits, we like to keep track of something called the potential of the voltage and the current. And I mentioned that there's a, kind of an analogy with water flow. Potential is like the pressure. Current is like the flow rate of water. With water, we would measure that in gallons per minute or liters per second. In electronics, we measure that in amps, coulombs of charge flowing through per second. All right, now another thing that comes up a lot is resistance. And resistance is kind of, it's what prevents flow from happening. It's what, keep, it's what limits the flow of current. So a resistor with a big resistance is like a pipe with a very small diameter. It's hard for the water to go through. And a resistor with a small resistance, that's like a big diameter pipe that the water flows through very readily. If I have a small pipe and a big pipe, they're the same length and they have the same pressure difference across them, the big pipe's gonna have more water flowing through, right? Okay, now, resistors. This is kind of what they look like. They're just little blobs. I, incidentally, I, this stuff I have to show you here, um, when we're done here, I'll stick around for a few minutes if they don't kick us out. And if you don't have to go somewhere, if you want to come up and see, you know, what is a multimeter? What does a resistor really look like? You can come up and handle one if you want. But they tend to be just a little blob with wires coming out of them, all right? And the cool thing about a resistor is they have a fixed resistance. The resistance is just some number, all right? What that means is if I take a resistor and I put a voltage across this resistor and I measure what the current is flowing through it, I've drawn this little plot here, the volt, as I increase the voltage, the current will increase linearly. If I have a negative voltage, meaning the voltage is bigger the other way, right? I reverse my battery, then I get current flowing in the opposite direction. So that's what makes something a resistor. It has a linear relationship between current and voltage. Okay. So more specifically, I, instead of showing you a hand-drawn plot, this is really what's happening. It's an equation known as Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is the most important equation that you're going to see doing electronics. It shows up over and over again. But it basically tells us what resistors do. It says that if I, put the current, if I take the current flowing through resistor times its resistance, that tells me the voltage across that resistor. So if I make this circuit where I have a battery and then a resistor and I get current flowing through here, all right, well, what is the voltage across that resistor? Well, it's the same as the voltage across the battery, right? That's what the battery is doing, is it's making a higher voltage here than here. So this voltage is higher than this voltage by the voltage of the battery, which in this case is epsilon. So how much current will flow through this resistor when I do that? Well, I just have to solve Ohm's law. I take this and I divide both sides by R, and I find, oh, I is just equal to V over R. Well, in this case, the voltage is epsilon, the voltage of my battery. So the current flowing through my resistor is just the battery voltage divided by the resistance. And that's Ohm's law. That's simple. OK, now, what happens if I have two resistors in series? What if I take one resistor and I connect it to the next resistor, and I put that in a circuit somehow? Well, it turns out resistors in series just act like uh, one resistor with some effective resistance. All right, without going through the details, if I have a bunch of resistors connected together one after the other, they act like one big resistor with an effective resistance, which is just the sum of all the resistances of the resistors I've put together. Does that make sense? So this is called series because the current flows from one resistor to the next resistor, right? Now, since my resistors are connected together, the current flowing through R1 has to be the same as the current flowing through R2, right? If I had a big water pipe and a small water pipe, whatever water goes in one, when it leaves, it has to go into the other one, right? So the flow rate would be the same for my different pipes, even though they have different diameters. Same thing with electronics. You can also wire up resistors in parallel. So in parallel means that my current comes in and it splits and it flows through a bunch of resistors in parallel and then comes back together again. 
If I have a bunch of resistors in parallel, I can think of them as one resistor with an effective resistance. And the effective resistance here is, well, you take all your resistors, you take one over their resistance, add all of those together, and then take one over that. And that gives you the effective resistance. So this, when you have them in series, they add together, you get something bigger than the individual resistors. In parallel, you get something which is smaller than the smallest resistor. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because what is a resistor? I put a voltage drop across it and I get some current going through. If I have two resistors in parallel, the total current flowing through that is going to be bigger than the current flowing through any one resistor. So that means, ah, I get more current than I would with one resistor for a given voltage, it must have less resistance, less effective resistance. Yes? Quick question. So does it always split the same? On the what do you mean does it split the same? Like the current. No, if I have a bigger yeah. resistor, in fact, you can analyze this just by applying Ohm's law to each one individually, right? That I have the same voltage here and here and the same voltage here and here. So the voltage dip drop across both of them is the same. So a smaller, if one of them is smaller than the other, more current will flow through that one. But before yeah. it gets to it, it's always the same amount. Yeah, so I have some current flowing through here, and that current, well, that's a good point. I didn't bring that up, that I should have mentioned the junction law, that if I have a junction, kind of all of the current flowing into that junction has to add up to zero, right? So if I have one amp flowing in and it splits out, and I have half an amp flow this way, I know there must be a half an amp flowing the other way, right? Because it's all got to be conserved. The charge is conserved. That's a good question, and I forgot to mention that in my slides. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, now... With this knowledge, we are equipped to learn about our first practical circuit. This is a circuit that is used over and over again in electronics. It's known as a voltage divider. So let me tell you when you might want to use one of these. Let's say you've got some high voltage photomultiplier tube that's measuring light being scattered by an atom in your lab, for example. Oh, is that, what's, that's not very practical. Let's say it's going to measure <laughs> whether the lights are on, right? So your kids come and they turn on the lights and you want your Arduino to respond to that. Someone turn on the lights, let's do something. Let's say that this detector puts out 20 volts when the lights are on and zero volts when the lights are off, all right? Your Arduino does not like 20 volts. It likes zero volts to five volts, right? Five is a TTL on, zero is off. So I want a way to convert that 20 volts into five volts. I want to divide it down. This circuit will do that, all right? So I have some voltage that comes in. This is my 20 volts. I don't want it to be 5 volts when it comes out. So how does this work? Well, I'm going to apply Ohm's law to this. So I have a voltage here. Oh, what's that symbol right there? Ground. That's ground. So ground means, usually we interpret ground to mean 0 volts, all right? So everything's measured. And remember, absolute voltage has no meaning. When I say V in is 20 volts, I mean it's 20 volts relative to whatever this is right here, right? That's why wires, there's always two wires when you carry a signal, right? You get a coaxial cable, there's the shield, there's the center conductor. You know, you get your uh, microphone connector, it's got at least two wires there. That's because, first of all, in order for a circuit to work, there's gotta be somewhere for the current to go. The current can't just go and usually, well, not long term, it can't just build up somewhere. It's gotta have somewhere to flow. Also, if I have a signal that's representing, you know, the sound coming out of my iPod, that voltage it's got to be some voltage relative to something, right? So I need another wire that says, okay, I'm measuring this voltage relative to the voltage of this wire. And this wire is zero for the circuit. So ground is a zero for my circuit. So relative to that ground, I have a voltage V in coming in. How much current is going to flow through those two resistors? Well, the question is, how much current flows out here? So in order to understand the circuit, I have to know what ha comes after it. Have you, ever looked like, have you ever looked at a schematic and said, how could some electrical engineer ever understand everything that's going on in the circuit? <laughs> the answer is they don't. They don't understand all of it at once. They understand it in pieces. We have to be able to understand pieces or things just get totally complicated. So I'm going to assume that essentially no current flows out of my circuit. And that makes it so I can analyze what it does. And we'll talk about in a minute what you do to make sure that no current flows out of your circuit. All right? So if no current flows out of my circuit, all the current flows this way. So I just basically have a voltage across two resistors in series. So I apply Ohm's law. Ohm's law, V equals IR. So I solve that for I. The current flowing through here is just V in minus zero is the voltage difference, right? So V in. And the resistance is the effective resistance of those two resistors. Are those resistors in series or parallel? Series. Series, right? The current flows through one, then the other. So the effective resistance is just the sum of the two. So now I know the current flowing through there is just going to be V in divided by R1 plus R2. I didn't want to know the current, though, did I? I wanted to know the voltage. But now that I know the current, I can find the voltage because I can apply Ohm's law just to this resistor alone. Sorry, my laser pointer is dying on me. 
and apply it to just that resistor alone, right? So if I apply Ohm's law just to this resistor, V out is going to equal to equal I times R2, but I is just this current that we already found. So you plug that in and you find that the voltage coming out is just Vn times R2 over R1 plus R2. So in our example, right, we have a 20 volt signal. We want to divide it down to 5 volts. That's a factor of 4, right? So if I, if I choose my resistor such that R1 is 3 times bigger than R2, it'll divide by a factor of 4 for me. I'll do what I want. All right? Okay, now, this problem of how do I make sure that no current flows out. If, if current flows out the end into our Arduino or whatever the next thing in, in our circuit is, then it'll mess up our analysis. And so what we like to do is we like to say, well, let's pretend like the thing it's flowing into is a resistor. And if you look up different components and things, it'll give you an input impedance. That says, if you're going to kind of pretend like you know, the signal coming into it flows into a resistor, this is the resistor you would pretend like it flows into. And you want to make sure that that input impedance of the thing this is going into is big compared to R2. Right? So that's the name of the game. We want to compartmentalize circuits, so we want to make sure that when we go out of one piece of our circuit into the next one, that the next one has a big input impedance so that not much current flows through. The input on an Arduino, I don't know what it is, but I think it's a pretty high value. Usually you can pretend like no current is flowing into your Arduino. All right? What happens if you have, if the next circuit actually does suck current? I'll show you in a minute. All right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about AC circuits, but I just wanted to point out, I'm going to assume that we just have some voltage and that voltage has been that voltage for all times. So I have some input voltage, I say like it's 20 volts, right? And then what comes out is 5. What if it's changing? What if it's not 20 volts? What if it's oscillating? Well, as long as it changes slowly enough, I can still do the analysis I'm doing. If the input starts to change really quickly, then you have to worry about more complicated stuff and you have to learn about AC circuit theory, which is a little more complicated. But you can read about that on Google, all right? It helps to know about complex numbers when you do that, by the way. Okay, you thought all that complex, why does anyone care about imagining numbers in math? Turns out to be really useful. All right, now, <laughs> passive circuit elements. So the simplest circuit elements are the passive circuit elements. The standard three passive circuit elements are resistors, capacitors, and inductors. I already showed you resistors. Here's the schematic symbol for a capacitor and for an inductor. And I'm not really going to go into them much because they mainly matter when you have AC signals, when you have something that's changing rapidly in time. Um, just to give a very bad description though, capacitors tend to smooth out voltage ripples and inductors tend to smooth out current ripples. But I'll leave it to Google to let you know what that really means. All right. Now here's some pictures of capacitors. Capacitors, I didn't, for some reason I don't have any pictures of inductors, but capacitors come in all different sizes and shapes. Um, here's a big capacitor, a little capacitor. Here's a little high voltage circuit that we built in my lab. There's a very big capacitor. Here's a somewhat big capacitor. Here's a little chip capacitor. Here's another capacitor. Huh? They can have a lot of voltage, you know. Yeah. Yeah, if you deal with capacitors, if you if you never have high voltages in your circuits, your capacitors typically won't get up to high voltages unless you have some crazy switching circuit. But if you like open up your monitor, you know, to fix something and there's a capacitor in there, even though it's unplugged, capacitors store charge and they can store high voltages and they can kill you if you don't know what you're doing. Yes. Also don't reverse them or they release their magic smoke. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about the smoke. Yeah, you stole my, stole my thunder. Um, but uh, some capacitors, you have to put them in a certain way. Some capacitors only let you put the higher potential on one lead. And some of them, like this one right here, you can plug it in any way you want. If you see one in a metal can like that, that's almost guaranteed to be what we call an electrolytic capacitor that has to be put in a certain way or it can explode. Which is, if you're careful, fun if you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> but be careful with them. So the only thing I'm going to tell you about capacitors, because I'm not going to tell you about AC circuits, is that if I have a chip, so this represents some chip with leads coming out of it, and if that chip requires power, so I put my power inputs to it, it's a good idea, very close to where you're putting power into your chip, to put a little capacitor to ground. And that acts like a little bucket of charge that you know, if this chip suddenly wants to draw a lot of current, the power supply is a long ways away and there's inductance that keeps the current from flowing nicely. This capacitor will smooth out the ripples in the voltage and give you better performance on your chip. Read the manufacturer's data sheets to figure out what's the best, but if you don't know, 0.1 microfarads is good for these decoupling capacitors typically. All right, now, moving on to more complicated circuit elements, diodes. 
probably everyone who plays with an Arduino will want to know about diodes because what's the first thing you do with an Arduino? You want to make lights blink, right? So you get an LED, and an LED is a certain special type of a diode. All right, so how do diodes work? I'm not going to tell you how they work. I'm just going to tell you what they do, all right? How they work is too much to talk about today. <laughs> but basically, the idea, the simplest model of a diode is it lets current flow through one way and not the other way. So if I put a negative, if I put a voltage trying to drive current backwards through my diode, as I increase the voltage, the current just stays at zero, right? But if I put voltage the other way, the current sh shoots up exponentially. So it's almost like a wire when I go in the other direction. A few finer points, though. It turns out it takes a finite voltage to get the diode started. That's known as the threshold voltage. I've noted the dotted line here. All right? For a typical silicon diode, that threshold voltage is about 0.6 volts. But for an LED, it's qu quite a bit higher. And it turns out it depends on the color. It, it, it turns out this threshold the physics of this threshold voltage is tied to the physics of emitting light. So when you change what color of LED you're using, you automatically change the threshold voltage. What about green? So green would be somewhere in between. So it, it goes with the wavelength. So green has a wavelength somewhere between red and blue, so it's going to have a threshold voltage somewhere in between. Incidentally, it, are any of you old enough to remember flashlights with incandescent bulbs? <laughs> Do you remember how they always had two batteries in them? That was just the standard thing. It was really rare to find one that didn't have two batteries. And then LED flashlights came out, and LED flashlights tended to have three batteries. Nowadays, they don't all have three batteries, but that was kind of the standard thing. Why three batteries? Well, it turns out white LEDs are actually ultraviolet LEDs with a little powder in there that fluoresces, kind of like what happens in a fluorescent light bulb. And so to get an ultraviolet LED going, you need more than the three volts you can get from two you know, AA batteries in series, or two C batteries in series. So you needed that third battery to get enough voltage to turn the LED on. All right, so that's what happens. There's this threshold voltage to be aware of. Incidentally, um, if you put a negative voltage, you put voltage to try and drive current the wrong way through a diode, it won't let the current through until you reach what's known as the breakdown voltage. Once you reach the breakdown voltage, different things can happen, depending on what diode it is, it might let the smoke out. All right. <laughs> Some diodes are actually designed, though, to be run this way, where there's a very specific voltage where they break down, and you can use that as a voltage reference. If you need to have something which is definitely going to be 6.5 volts, you can buy a type of a diode known as a Zener diode, and it's designed to let current run through it backwards once you hit this breakdown voltage of 6.5 volts, or whatever voltage you, you know, bought, whatever voltage you specified for that diode. All right, so now I want to make an LED blink on my Arduino. You might say, okay, so I have a battery here, but a battery could represent anything that makes a fixed voltage, right? So this could be your, the output of your Arduino. It can put out zero volts or five volts, whatever we program it to do, right? So think of this, not a battery, but the output of our Arduino. And this is a symbol for a diode right here. It's a little arrow with a line, and it tells you that's the way current will flow through. Current won't flow through that way. If you put a little squiggly arrow off to the side, that means this is not just a diode, this is an LED. That's supposed to be light leaving your diode, all right? So I could take this, first ignore this resistor. What if I just connected that to my Arduino? Well, if we go back to this last slide, you see as I increase the voltage, the current increases exponentially. It increases really fast. So if I want to put just the right amount of current so it'll turn on but not burn up, I've got to hold the voltage very precisely. That's really hard to do. So instead of doing that, a standard thing to do is just put a little resistor in series, all right? And then what happens is the, there's how much voltage will there be across our diode? Whatever you choose. Well, something close to the threshold voltage of that diode, right? So if it's a red LED, there will be about two volts across that diode when it's running. And if I try and increase the voltage, if I increase this voltage right here, it's going to just try and draw more current to get rid of that voltage, right? Okay, so if I put this resistor here, what's going to happen is I'm going to have this voltage, say the five volts coming from my Arduino, some current will flow. That current flowing through my resistor, remember Ohm's law, if current's flowing through my resistor, that causes a voltage drop across the resistor. So some of the voltage will drop across my resistor and some will drop across the diode. Let's say I've got just the right current flowing through my diode and then I increase the voltage here a little bit. If not for the resistor, a little increase in voltage will make a huge increase in current. But with this resistor here, I increase the voltage a little bit, more current starts to flow, more current causes a bigger voltage drop in our resistor. So more current will flow, but it'll be a nice linear-ish increase. It won't be cra that crazy exponential that we would have if we just had the diode. So this is how you make your uh,
diodes blink on your Arduino, you put a resistor, and then you put your diode. Now what size resistor should I use? We're going to use Ohm's law. All right, so presumably, I know what the threshold voltage is of my diode, all right? And presumably, I know the voltage of my battery or the output of my Arduino. That For my Arduino, the output would be, say, 5 volts. And say this is a red LED, so this is going to be 2 volts. That means the voltage across my resistor, I need that to be the difference between the two. So if this is 5 volts and 2 volts, that means my resistor needs to burn off 3 volts. Well, that voltage that the resistor needs to burn off, that's just equal to I times R, right? Presumably, when I buy this diode, I look up how much current it's supposed to have when it's operating. So I know how much current I want to flow through the circuit, and that's just I. So I know this, I know this, and I know I. I just have to solve for R. And so I do that, right? Do my algebra, divide both sides by I, and I find that R is this. Well, notice I wrote greater than or about equal to. <clears throat> it's not a bad idea to maybe start with a resistor that's a little too big, just in case things don't work exactly how you think. And if the, if the LED looks like it's too dim, then you can maybe bring the resistor down. Also, when you go to your resistor kit, you're not going to find a resistor with exactly this value, right? And so you'll say, I've got one here, I've got one here. Should I choose the smaller one or the bigger one? one. Choose the bigger one, save your diode. Although diodes are cheap, <laughs> so if you kill it, <clears throat> just make sure you have a bag of them, right? So you can replace it. I've never seen a diode do anything very interesting when it dies. It just, it's really bright for a second and it's gone though, so. <laughs> <coughs> All right, transistors. Transistors are much more complicated to understand than diodes, but not overly complicated, all right? But they're complicated enough that I'm not going to take the time to talk about them today. But just if you see a schematic and it's got a circle with some wires going into it, it's probably a transistor. And, and also you should know that there's a whole bunch of different types of, resist, of transistors. So I've got here, this is a bipolar uh, BJT transistor. This is a MOSFET. So there's all kinds of different transistors. Transistors make the world go around in electronics. They're the heart and soul of just about everything interesting in electronics. But you don't have to understand what they do in order to use them because you can do something like buy an integrated circuit that has a bunch of, that has a bunch of transistors inside of it that the engineers have put together to do something useful for you that you don't have to understand what the transistors individually are doing in order to use the circuit. All right? This particular integrated circuit is an op amp. All right? An op amp is a special type of circuit, the uh, integrated circuit that shows up all the time. And let me tell you what op amps do. So this is what op amps do. Inside of an op amp, there's a tiny little man. <laughs> all right? OK, there are two inputs and one output. And this tiny little man, he looks at the voltages on these two inputs, but he doesn't let current flow in them. So he just looks at the voltage without letting current flow through. All right? And if the voltage of this input, this is known as the non-inverting or positive input. This is known as the inverting or negative input. If the non-inverting input has a higher voltage than the inverting input, it'll raise the voltage of the output. And it'll keep doing that until they're equal. If this one is smaller than that one, it'll lower the voltage of the output. And it'll keep doing that until they're equal. Well, how would they ever be equal? Well, we've got to have some circuit that connects them together so there's some feedback. All right. Now, um, the cool thing is, the circuit that comes after this, it may suck up some current, all right? The op amp takes care of that for you, right? You don't have to worry about, let's say I have a voltage divider that's on the front end of this thing driving this. No current flows in here, essentially, very little. If you look at the input impedance of this particular op amp, I think it's like uh, 10 billion ohms or something. It's incredibly large. So essentially, no current will flow in these inputs, but Whatever happens over here, op amp man, it doesn't steal current from here or here to make that voltage work. It steals current from a power supply that you hook up, hook up to it. All right? So one cool thing you can do with op amps, oh, I'll show you in a minute. But first I have to tell you, you stole my joke here. But um, there's not really a little man inside op amps. How do op amps really work? Well, they're magic. <laughs> and magic is just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. So don't let the smoke out of your electronic components or they won't run. Now, incidentally, the best way, the fastest way to get smoke out of your uh, electronics is to hook up the power backwards. Always look before you turn on the power supply and make sure that you actually have the plus going to the plus and the minus to the minus, or you'll see smoke. Yes? Uh, so this is why it's really important when you're jump-starting a car to get the, the no-drag Yeah, yeah. 
So, um, yeah. <laughs> I never thought about cars because they're always constantly letting out smoke, but somehow they still work, don't they? <laughs> I have to think about that one. <laughs> I have to think about that. All right. So here's, here's a really cool thing you can do with an op amp, for example. Remember I said, what happens if I have this voltage divider, but the thing after it sucks current? That makes it hard to understand what my circuit's going to do, right? Because I, I can't make that assumption that no, no current's going to flow. Well, here's what you do. So imagine I've got a circuit over here, and I've got a circuit over here, and this circuit wants to suck current, all right? I put this thing in between them, right? So my voltage from my voltage divider, for example, will come in here. It goes into the op amp. No current flows into my op amp. Essentially, no current flows into my op amp, all right? And then I have this input connected to the output. Op amp man, he's going to adjust this voltage until these two are equal, right? So this output voltage is going to be the same as the input voltage. If this circuit after it wants current, where does that current come from? Not from my voltage divider, but from the power supply, powering up the op amp. So this is known as a voltage follower. This is a way to put a little break between circuit elements so that you can understand what this one does and what this one does and what this one does and understand them all independent of each other just by putting a voltage follower in between them. Here's another thing you can make with an op amp. This is known as an inverting amplifier. My daughter over here, she's 13, Last summer, she came up to my lab. I had scavenged some really big speakers that the acoustics group were throwing out, and I thought, we can have the baddest sound system in the entire department. So I put these down in my lab, but we didn't have an amplifier for them. So I had my daughter come in and build me one with just parts we had around in our lab. And this is what she used to do the amplification. It's known as an inverting amplifier. She just took an op amp and wired it up like this. All right? And what you get on the output is the input multiplied by some gain. And what will that gain be? How do we figure that out? We're going to use Ohm's law. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, look, how much current flows through here? Well, the first, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, I've wired the non-inverting input up to zero, so its voltage is zero. And if I have feedback set up the right way and op amp man does his job, the inverting input will be at the same voltage, so it'll also be at zero, right? So the two inputs to my op amp should be at zero volts if everything's working right. Okay, then I use Ohm's law, and I say, well, how much current is flowing through this resistor right here? Well, I just take this voltage minus that voltage, and that's the voltage across my resistor. That's Vn minus V minus. If I divide by that resistance, that gives me the current flowing through that resistor. This resistor right here, if I take V minus minus V out and divide that by that resistance, that gives me the current flowing through there, right? That's just Ohm's law. And then, because no current flows in this input, Whatever current flows through here also has to flow through that resistor. They must be the same current. So I'll set them equal to each other. And then I'll remember, ah, V minus is going to be zero if everything's working properly. So if I set those to zero and solve for V out, I get V out is equal to minus V in RF over RI. So I, the I stands for input, F stands for feedback. I don't think there's a convention. I, that's the convention that I like to use sometimes when I'm not doing something else. Um, so let's say I have the sound coming from my computer and I want to amplify the voltage by a factor of 10 for a sound system. Well, I wire this up and I make RF 10 times bigger than RI. Say this is 10 kilo ohms, this is 1 kilo ohm. Now what comes out? I put a volt in, what do I get? I get minus 10 volts out. I put minus 1 volt in, I get plus 10 volts out. That's why it's called an inverting amplifier because you get gain, but it also flips your signal over. Right? There's that minus sign. It's the gain is negative. So I still get a bigger signal, but it's bigger but inverted. Now, one, thing, one caveat, my daughter will probably realize that her circuit had something else in it. That's because typically these op amps can't put out a lot of current. They're great for boosting the voltage. They, they typically can't put out a lot of current. So you wouldn't want to take this and then put the output right to a big speaker system. So she had another circuit. She had a, a pair of transistors that could boost the current. I don't have time to tell you about all of that. but. There's your basic converting amplifier. OK, any questions about that? So I told you Ohm's law was useful, right? So we're understanding complicated integrated circuits, but it all works around Ohm's law. All right, now digital circuits. You'll probably want to do some stuff with digital circuits, right? So the key with digital circuits is we have ones and zeros, and we represent them with a voltage. There's different schemes for that, but the most common one is what's known as TTL, or transistor-transistor logic. In transistor-transistor logic, 0 to 0.8 volts represents a 0, and 2.2 to 5 volts represents a 1. 
Any voltage in between there means something's not working right. All right, you're out of spec. All right. Typically, circuits will put out something very close to zero and something very close to five volts when you work with this. So, for example, here's some logic gates. You've probably seen logic gates like this before in programming, right? I've got an AND, a NOT, and an OR gate. How would I realize an AND gate electronically? Well, you can buy a little chip that's an AND gate, right? You give it power. It has to have a power supply. And then if I have 5 volts and 5 volts here, I'll get 5 volts on the output. If I have 0 volts and 5 volts, I'll get 0 volts on the output and so forth. So we just represent our ones and zeros with five volts or zero volts. Now, when you go to deal with digital circuits, a lot of them will have something called a clock input. And I just want to explain what that is so you're not confused. Like say, for example, you have your Arduino and you're going to use your Arduino to maybe dim the lights. And so you want to have your Arduino put out a continuous like voltage, you know, somewhere between zero and five volts that can control some light dimmer. But your Arduino doesn't put out some arbitrary voltage, it gives you zero volts or five volts on any given pin, right? It's, a, it's got digital outputs. So I can buy a thing called a digital to analog converter. And that will take a bunch of digital lines in that describe a number, and it'll you know, take this binary number and convert it to a voltage that comes out, right? So let's, say, let's imagine that this is a digital to analog converter right here. And I have a bunch of pins on my Arduino that are wired up to the digital inputs of my uh, digital to analog converter, my DAC. And I put out some number, and it puts out the voltage that I want. And then I want to change the light level, so I'm going to change my digital number. Well, guess what? They won't all change simultaneously, right? They'll probably change almost simultaneously, right? But there's, there's always going to be some moment in time where this bit has updated and this one hasn't, right? So what is my digital to analog converter going to do? Well, it's going to put out lots of weird random things until it finally settles on the voltage that I want. That's probably not what we want it to do. So that's actually not what a DAC would typically do. A DAC would typically have a clock input. And what happens is when you change the input bits, it'll just ignore them. It'll keep putting out the value that it was putting out before until the clock cycles. Depending on the chip, you would cycle the clock by taking it from 0 to volts to 5 volts and back. Or maybe you're holding it at 5 volts and you bring it to 0 and back. But once you do the clock cycle, that tells it, all right, I've got my digits updated. So it's holding some value. You change the digital, you know, the binary number that you're sending to it. Once you've got all those bits set, you'll have another pin on your Arduino that's hooked up to the clock, and you'll make that go higher than low again, and then the DAC will say, oh, I've got a new number, and it'll put out the new one. Does that make sense? So that's what the clock input is for. It's telling it, I've, I'm ready for you to take the new values. Also, a lot of chips will have an enable pin. And the idea with the enable pin is, depending on whether it's 5 volts or 0 volts, it'll either listen to the clock or it won't. And that's really nice. So maybe you have three different digital to analog converters you've hooked up to your Arduino. And you don't have enough pins on your Arduino to drive them all. So what you can do is you can hook up the same pins on your Arduino to the, all the different DACs. So you know, your least significant bit is the same for all of your DACs is the same pin on your Arduino. And your most significant is the same for all of your DACs. They all connect to the same pin on your Arduino. And then when you go to program a value, right? they're all going to want to program the same value. You can't control them independently. Well, you can because you'll have three other pins on your Arduino, which will go to the enable pins on your DACs. And you'll only enable one of those chips. And so only one of them will be listening at any given time. So you can tell, it, tell which chip to pay attention to the signal I'm giving it. Does that make sense? OK, and that's all I have time to tell you about with digital circuits. Um, whew, we're running out of time. Packaging. Now, chips come in different packages, different shapes and sizes. If you open up your iPod, you will see tiny little resistors. And you're going to say, there's no way I could solder those by hand. So you, don't, you want to make sure you don't buy those ones, all right? So when you buy chips, um, there are, you want, when you're buying like resistors and capacitors and transistors, you want to make sure the word you're looking for is leaded. You want to make sure that your, your components have leads on them that you can solder. So you're going to look for leaded stuff. All right. When you're getting like op amps or microprocessors, probably the package you want is known as a DIP package, because even a DIP can solder. No, it stands for dual inline package. All right. So it's it's basically this little thing that looks like a little monster with legs on either side. So it's dual inline package, and you can stick those into your springboard. You can stick them into your uh, perf board and solder them up or whatever. So if you're buying transistors, resistors, and capacitors and such, you're looking for leaded. If you're buying 
you know, integrated circuits, you're looking for something in a dip package typically. Now, what you are not looking for is surface mount. If you see surface mount in the description, that's probably not what you want. Also, these things right here are known as chip carriers or dip sockets. They have little spring-loaded things that you can stick your chip into, all right? They're less flaky than the spring-loaded things here because they hold much more tight. It's, it's harder to get them in and out. But the nice thing about those, when you, when you get your circuit going on your springboard, right, if an op-amp dies, you can pull that chip out and put a new one in. But once you put a solder onto your circuit board, if something dies, it's kind of a pain to get it off. So whenever I put a dip chip into a circuit, I'll actually solder one of these chip carriers down and then just slide the chip into it. Then if something dies or if I think it's dead and I need to take it and test it somewhere, it pops right out. All right, so chip carriers, no to surface mount. Let me show you. Here's some, we've done surface mount electronics in my lab. And here are some op amps that are surface. Look how much smaller they are. There's a, uh, let's see, that's a capacitor. These are resistors. They're really, really tiny, all right? And like these chip resistors and capacitors, they don't even have leads off of them. You have to solder right to the object. And there are ways to do that. Uh, we have a little toaster oven in our lab that we use to do surface mount electronics. But if you're just getting started in, in electronics, you probably don't want to buy surface mount. You probably will at some point, and you'll have a little bag in your tool chest of surface mount op amps that you have no use for, but you can't bear to throw out. And everyone has one of those, all right? But try to avoid buying them by accident. Yes? Another thing you can look for is through hole. Through hole. That's another good term. Through hole means it's got a lead that can go through a hole. That's what you want. Yes? So what's axial? Okay, oh, so like, um, like if you buy a capacitor, it can have axial leads, which means it's kind of shaped like you know, these resistors here, where they come, but the leads come out on the axis. Or if you've seen those capacitors like that are kind of round, like a, like a plate, and they have leads coming out this way, that would be radial, because the leads come out in the radial direction. All right? Okay, it's a good question. Put it up there, and I didn't talk about it. Okay, um, quickly, oh, we're out of time. Data sheets, know that they're out there. Any part that you buy, there's probably, if you, if you can remember that part number, you can Google it, and you'll probably come up with a thing called a data sheet that has everything you need to know about that part, all right? Um, we're out of time. Read about soldering. Don't go and do soldering without reading about it first, because bad, or, bad solder joints will make your life miserable. Um, and since we're out of time, too, just debugging, Debug as you go. Don't build a whole circuit and then go back and try and figure out what's wrong with it. Make sure that stage one works. Make sure that stage two works. Build things a little at a time and debug as you go. And that's, I guess, all I have time to tell you about. So, um, like I say, all these slides go right here. You can see everything that I showed you, that list of components. Uh, also, if you go to this, if you go to these slides, make sure you click on the comics so you can go to my comic archive and read all of the great <laughs> nerdy comics up there. Um, and I guess with that, we're officially out of time. If anyone wants to stick around and ask me questions or wants to come up and get hands-on with uh, this stuff, I, I'd be glad to stick around for a few minutes and do that.